Today, I'm talking to Rencia Manuel, who is the CEO of Growbox, which is a, a new startup company here in Cape Town. Uh, very excited to hear about her, and I will read to you the reason why uh, we're having this conversation today. We're very excited because she has agreed to do uh, a case study with our case writing center here at the GSB. So there is a new case uh, based on her Growbox company that is called Growbox, the reality of emerging market challenges for an entrepreneur in Cape Town. So I'm very pleased to be joined by Renchi. Renchi, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I'm always interested in these conversations about people who've started new things. So, so can you tell us, for those of us who don't know about, your, about Growbox, can you tell us what exactly is Growbox and, and how did it start? Okay, so first of all, Growbox is a social enterprise that empowers households to grow their own food organically at their own homes. We do this through our three spheres, the first being a wholesale um, seedling nursery, where we grow the vegetable and the herb seedlings wholesale, supplying farmers, retail nurseries, government entities, and also the, um, the average household that just wants to grow their own food. Our second sphere being our veggie boxes, it's elevated veggie boxes that allow you to grow your own vegetables, whether it's on a balcony or patio space. And the third sphere of our business being the food gardening uh, consultation services that we provide. For instance, if you've got a veteran piece of land and you have no idea where to start, we go and we'd assist you and help you plan that area and plant a edible garden that you can use to, you know, grow your own food. Hmm. So this is so this is sustainable food gardening, right? Yes. Yes. And, and so. It's a very interesting premise, I think, especially here in Cape Town, but in general. So, so why is that so important? Why is sustainable food gardening such an important area? Um, because many households, especially um, low-income households, don't have access to food. Um, and, you know, the social grant that they receive is so little that it's not enough to sustain a family for an entire month. And because of that, we know that it's very important that people should access um, food at their own homes and that's why we've created these veggie boxes that gives you the garden space um, and the opportunity to grow your own food even though there is no spaces available around their homes. So that's I think really interesting because I think one of the big challenges we're seeing for a lot of people is one access to, to good food, healthy food, um, but also that it requires some space. So this, this idea of urban agriculture I think is really interesting. So um, has urban agriculture really taken off in Cape Town? Is there a lot of other people in this, in this line or is it something that hasn't really taken off so far? It's something that is starting to get momentum in Cape Town. Um, at first it used to be reserved mostly for NGOs or NGOs, you know, um, and especially in the low income areas. But right now it's really taking off with people seeing the need for fresh organic produce. Um, for homegrown food, and also the fact that eating organic, buying organic is so expensive. Um, mm. Yeah, that the average household is struggling to kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're struggling to eat in the house like that. So I think the movement is coming, and also with the recent corona of people having to go out and get food, they've realized that um, it's easier to grow your own food at home. Right. Well, that, I think that's a really interesting point. So uh, one of the questions we had in here, and I'll skip ahead to it just because I think you brought it up and it's really relevant here, is have you seen real impacts from COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus, on, on your business or urban ag agriculture in general? It, it had an impact on the business, firstly, from a wholesaler's point of view, because why all the businesses were halted and we had that abrupt halt from um, business. And but. Agriculture was allowed to continue um, because people needed food and the farmers needed to supply the food to the stores. So because of that, it kind of gave us the boost where no one else had that opportunity. So we could supply our seedlings to the small scale farmers. Um, and then also the need to have food and to access food. Um, our sales kind of boosted during the whole pandemic with households wanting to grow their own food and not wanting to go out to a store and buy food. And also the time because households and families were at home, so it gave parents, you know, the time that they never had before to spend with the kids, to grow food with the kids and, 
yeah so from that point of view we were doing quite well mm. <laughs> during the pandemic uh selling seedlings and also selling our veggie boxes and the seedlings to households okay yeah and i think it's interesting to see sort of how some industries and some companies have um really sort of been able to exist and even thrive during covid-19 while well, these other issues so i think it's you know obviously this social enterprise as you said at the beginning this this providing of a service that is good for society um what are some of the biggest challenges so i mean here's some opportunities that covid-19 and lockdowns have provided but what are some of the biggest challenges you've had in terms of getting growbox off the ground and sort of where it is now When I first started out and that was in 2016 my first challenge was that I did not understand the business jargon that everyone else was using. Um I remember I was in my first business workshop so to say and they were saying a whole lot of words that I didn't understand and I keep doing this saying that it's going way above my head and everyone was laughing at me and I think that at first was my was having to learn you know and adapt and um understand you know uh, things like uh, presentations and budgets it's, i've always been a working bee and never in a position where i had to do a presentation or i had to um send in a pitch deck or something like that so having to learn all that it was a huge huge adjustment um and then because i started the business with no income no employment i had no funds whatsoever it was a struggle to have to go out there and um convince people that this is the idea that i have and this is the dream that i have and could you please help me pursue this dream or this business venture because um yeah i i never had any savings i didn't have any, any employment and yeah i basically started from nothing um yeah <laughs> that was it um and then as the business started to take off we were hit with the drought in cape town and there was a mm. huge drought and day zero was going around and it it was cr- quite frustrating because we couldn't use potable water um there was all these restrictions on water usage and i was growing seedlings and on on the other side i was trying to family and Um, and I go to markets on the weekends and to organic markets and I sell the seedlings um and people will tell me but you can't be selling plants and you can't be selling these things because we have a drought you understand so mm. yeah it was having to overcome that hurdle and then it was last year we we had we just started getting off the ground everything was fantastic and um really because everything was just you know we had a fixed clientele we had contracts everything and then the break in happened and it totally hit me for everything because basically i had to start from scratch they destroyed the mm. infrastructure they stole stock they damaged stock that was totally unnecessary so yeah and now we have to deal with covid but luckily we I was managed to find a way to work around that <laughs> yeah and I think that that you know your story and you you won some awards you put in uh with your children you put in some videos to win some awards and try to generate some capital that way as well so you've been very resourceful um in in bootstrapping this business and getting it going um I'm really curious about you know if you could make a recommendation to I don't know to the government to society as whole how can we make it easier uh, what are some things we can put in place to make it easier for small businesses like yours who are you know these startups these small entrepreneurships how can we help support them to enable more people to grow there's a lot of red tape involved firstly um it's like the first time i went to nyda they asked for a business plan and they asked for things like that for someone like me who did not know either and knew how any of this work but i had an idea and a vision it was cr- quite um what's the word i'm looking for um stifling it was mm. yeah because i know what i wanted and i know the vision that i had and, and and i knew the goal that i had in mind but having to put what i had up here onto paper was and then i had It took me about 2 years to learn all of that how to mm. draw up a business plan how to do the 5 year um 
budget um, or five year projections. And but yeah, if they could kind of assist you with that beforehand and then tell you, okay, since you completed the stage and now you can start applying and now you can. So I think that would be a great help. And also opportunities like that with regard to entrepreneurship and business, it's not readily available for us, especially on the Cape Flats. Um, mm. If I speak to anyone in my area, they don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm speaking a completely different language because it's not something that we grew up with. It's, it's not something that's introduced to us. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I think it's the concept of we are taught that we must go work and that, you know, we ourselves can't be business person or just learn the skills around entrepreneurship. That was very hard for me at first. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, no, it's, it's I think a completely that, new ahead. environment. Right. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I think, uh, you know, the, there's the, the policy side of, you know, what are the rules, regulations, how easy to make it. But as you said, it's also, uh, you know, how do, when we're educating people, when they're in the schools, uh, I think the old fashioned model was, as you said, we're preparing people to get a job somewhere else, yeah. whereas entrepreneurship is so important, which is an entirely, you know, a whole different set of skill sets, which isn't just get a job that's there. It's create a job, create a business yeah. that employs other people. So it's a, it's a very big mindset leap, I think, for, for all of us, really, in terms of education. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, too, about um, you. And so I'm reading the case study that, that we're doing with you and, you know, just the details in there, all the different things you have to do in order to keep the business going, to get it started, to get new clients. So how do you, you know, you have to water the plants, you have to distribute, you have to take orders, you have to build new clients. How do you prioritize on a day-to-day -day basis? What's most important for you to spend your time on? Because obviously you've only got so many hours in a day. How do you figure out what's the biggest priority for, you know, next or for today or for this week? I kind of prioritize it like, I have things that I do on a weekly basis, things that I do on a daily basis, and things I do on a monthly basis. So, for instance, monthly basis will be the Facebook ads or the social media ads. I have the schedule. I do it once a month, and this is the theme for the month, and that's the topics that will go out on certain days, and then it's out there. Um, and then my things that I do on a weekly basis, for instance, check if my meetings are on time, um, check up on, the, on my big contact clients and see um, if the orders are still up to date and if they're going out at the same time and, um, you know, just checking up on them and getting feedback from them on whether or not the stock will be going out on time. And then the things I do on a daily basis is watering the seedlings, the maintenance, checking if there's no infestation on our seedlings or... Um, any slugs that ate them up or something like that. So, yeah, yeah that's the day-to-day yeah. -day thing. So I've, I've kind of, got, I think I've gone down to a T, uh, weekly, yeah. uh, daily, yeah. weekly, and monthly. Yeah, that kind of kept me sane, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, so you, you sort of have this plan in place. So it's it, obviously there'll be surprises, but you've built up over, over the time that you've been running this business a sort of a plan that you can keep to. Yeah, and then Corona came and it messes everything up because now I'm in the house with four kids and I'm on Zoom calls and I'm putting a block behind me so they don't see the rest of my house. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. We've discussed before we came on. This this is a backdrop. This is the backdrop to my to my apartment. So uh, I don't have four kids running around though. So I, I can't, I can't uh, in any way empathize with that, but I can sympathize for sure. Um, yeah. So. You know, I, I, one of the other things you mentioned at the beginning, which I think is really important, is this is a social enterprise. This is social entrepreneurship. So um, is that make it easier, harder? What what impact has that had in terms of how you look at the business or how the business runs? I, I think it makes it easier because it kind of keeps me aligned, aligned to my goals and my vision for the business. Um, mm. I'm always thinking, are we making enough impact? Um, are we doing enough? Um, and I think it's COVID, where we won't only be growing the vegetable seedlings, a portion of our nursery we will be um, using as a food garden, as a full-time food garden. 
we will be employing extra community workers to grow vegetables there that they themselves will sell as an income for themselves. So, um, yeah, I'm always thinking, are we doing enough? Is there enough impact? And especially for an area like an overpark, COVID has hit this community for everything that it's got. Um, mm -hmm. People were li literally living from hand to mouth and now they are not being able to work. Yes, we're going to level three, but most of them have very not work. So the opportunities where I can employ extra pe um, you know, community workers where we can do greater impact. And I think that this addition to the business where we'll be starting a food garden, having community members grow that food, sell that food and use that as an extension and be a, of the business, I think will be a great asset. And not only that, I, I'm actually envisioning a starting a market in September, October side. I think then we'll be in spring. Where they but also incorporate other vendors, for instance, um, homemade goods, homemade crafts, and turn it into a real community market where they could show off the good salad and also promote community cohesion and interactions um, with, mm. the people, with each other within an overpark. So it's, you're always thinking about what's next, always thinking about what's next, which is great. Um, you know, you've obviously been so generous to, to give our case writing center access to you and your business to, to direct, develop these case writing um, center cases. Um, and do this video. And I think, you know, just one of the questions I wanted to end on was uh, what advice, you know, you've had to learn this in some cases very hard way uh, through experience <laughs> and trial and error. Um, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting their own businesses? What are some of the things that you would, you know, you wish you could go back in time and maybe tell yourself, what, what would you pass along to them as they start their process of, of starting their own business? Okay. I think the first thing would be don't, don't think your dreams are too big and don't let that discourage you and think that uh, this vision is too big for me and I can't do it. That is, it's actually the bigger the better because if you reach for the sky and, and you fall, at least you'll be somewhere higher than where you started off. So don't be discouraged at all. The bigger the better the dreams. And another thing is don't be intimidated by what to do. Use that as motivation to learn more. Because at first I used to be very discouraged about, oh, I'm not on that level, or I don't know enough. But yeah, it might take you some time. Go out there and learn. And as long as you're willing to learn, then the world is completely open to you. There's nothing that you cannot do. Mm. Yeah. And another thing is just go out there and do it. I mean, if I could do it and I had no money when I started that and I had absolutely no knowledge of how I want or how I was going to get there, but I just made it and anyone can do it if I can do it. Well, Renchia, I, I'm sure that's not entirely true, but um, <laughs> thank you so much for, for being willing to do this again for uh, I'm super interested at, you know, in, in reading the, the case that you wrote up. I've been, I've been sort of interested in doing some Googling on your company. It's been very interesting to read about. I really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy day. As you said, all the different things you have to do in order to keep this, this, uh, this business of yours going. So thank you for taking the time today to have a discussion with us. We really appreciate it. And I want to say, you know, best of luck in keeping the business going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure.